This small good afternoon and welcome to everybody joining today's Insignia webinar. Um, today we're going to be talking about social engineering and people hacking. We've done a couple of webinars over the last six months on a cyber theme along with other topics, but this is something that we've not looked at specifically before. And I guess if I broaden this out first of all in terms of the role and function and importance of people within crisis management, what I've learned over the years is that actually people are fundamental to all parts of crisis management, beginning with uh, creating the right culture, so that's particularly relevant to leaders of organisations, the role they play in creating a crisis resistant culture, the people who have to respond to a crisis, making sure that they have the right capabilities, the teamwork that's required in a crisis, getting the best out of the people on your crisis management team or teams, leadership, the courage, the values, the wisdom to make those critical decisions from the person with whom the buck ultimately stops. Communication, having those skills of being able to get your message across to uh, the stakeholders affected by a situation. And talking of stakeholders, people from the media who will always want and be looking for people related stories and for good or ill most crises ultimately are about people being affected and we've also seen over the years and very much over the last few weeks the behaviors ethics and actions of people coming under scrutiny within a crisis management and reputational context critical within crisis management are your own people, the people that work for your organization. And they can absolutely be your very best ambassadors. They can also be a very effective first line of defense in preventing or identifying crisis, acting as, a, as an early warning system but they'll only be able to do that if they know what to do and say when they spot a prob problem or something goes wrong, and if they operate within a culture of psychological safety. And nowhere is this more true than with regard to cybersecurity. And that's why I am so pleased today to be joined by Oliver Kirsch, who's Managing Director of Finch Cyber. And today he will be sharing his experience of social engineering and what's come to be known as people hacking as it relates to cybersecurity. So Oliver's going to be sharing some thoughts with you over the next 20 minutes or so. Um, please, as we go through the session, add your questions via the um, questions pane within the control panel uh, on your screen. We'll take those questions at the end. I've got a handful that I want to put to Oliver anyway once he's got through his uh, presentation, but we're more than happy to take your questions too. So we'll be with you for just under, under an hour. Do pose your questions, uh, but with that I'm going to hand over to Oliver to pick up the reins and uh, pull the curtain back in terms of what this social engineering uh, and people hacking is all about and of course to begin with to tell you a little bit more about his background uh, and how he came to be an expert in social engineering and people hacking. Over to you Oliver. Wonderful. Firstly, Jonathan, thank you very much for having me on the webinar today. Thank you everyone for joining as well. My story in 30 seconds if you will so i began in cyber security a number of years ago in sales uh, moved over into technical pre-sales and solution architecture uh, within an mdr function so working within a security operations center so gained a nice broad view of uh, everything the cyber security industry has to offer from there when i moved on from 
Um, the SOC, I was taken under the wing of one of the leading practitioners of open source intelligence and social engineering work. So somebody that he worked with law enforcement on finding missing people, he's worked uh, within other circles in uncovering criminal gangs, he's uh, an excellent coach and mentor. And after that, Finch was born. So Finch was uh, born to address the gap in specialist support for the human layer of cybersecurity within organizations. The industry over the previous 10 to 20 years has had uh, a very much almost singular focus on the technological aspects and the procedural and risk management aspects. But now things are changing and the importance on our human layer, our people, is coming to the fore. So we do a range of live and bespoke engagements where we apply an attacker's perspective to the work we undertake. Through that, we drive culture change, we drive better security awareness with organisations and help people to protect themselves. So, Jonathan, if you could... Um, Send of control, that would be awesome. And then we will move forward. I believe you should have control now, Oliver. If you haven't, then I will. Uh... Oh, there we go. There we go. So, uh, some of you might already be wondering well, what is open source intelligence? What is social engineering? As Jonathan wonderfully explained, that is uh, translated often to people hacking, but open source intelligence underpins it. Now, before I get into it, I wanted to introduce a little more about Jonathan. So I had a brief look through uh, Jonathan's social media profiles, uh, 10 minutes or so, and I pulled this letter from his beloved Aston Villa. What does it contain? An old, perhaps, childhood address. And this tweet, picture a game back in 2021. So. I wanted to get a little bit more context out of this. These two on their own, quite innocuous, and to be honest, they're still quite innocuous. So what could we get? Can we get any more context out of it? Well, looking at the game that Jonathan posted about, 23rd of May 2021, just after COVID, back at the football grounds, and with a little bit of cropping and zooming, we were able to find the sign just behind Jonathan. So we have here in every sense and the trophies underneath. So after that, cross-referencing the location in the famous Holt End with ticket resale and seating plant websites, I would make it around L3, row PP, seat 47. Jonathan, does that sound about right? That's, that's scarily accurate, yes. Wonderful. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to pause on this one. And I just want everyone to keep that in mind, this seemingly innocuous information, a photograph at a football match, an old letter. Hold that there and we'll bring it into context a little bit later. So, most of you will be familiar with what you see in front of you now. The three pillars, as they're commonly known, of a cybersecurity posture. People, process and technology. So, people, the first line of defense. Do you people execute best practice with regards to protecting the data that they handle? Do they have a good understanding of the organization's risks, responsibilities, and commitments to its cybersecurity maturity? Process, commonly referred to in the industry as governance, risk, and compliance, often led by frameworks, for example, NIST, ISO, the process pillar serves as guidance across multiple realms of organizations. For example, technical security standards that we're expected to uphold, or as we move towards Insignia's line of work, incident response and management mechanisms. Technology, that's what we see in our homes and workplaces, and we have done for three decades or so now. The bricks and windows that form the wall, the CCTV that monitors the points of entry, and so on. The problem is, as we see them in isolation here, they only represent a list. Understanding the relationship between them is gonna be key. So if we fulfill each of these individually without respecting where they sit with one another, it isn't quite sufficient. So we wanna get these pillars of security into context. So number one, people. 
pillar number one, front and center. Our organizational leaders that determine the approach to security through creation of policies, through internal advocacy, through budgeting, and so on. Once the policies are established, they then guide our people. These two work back and forth. IT for infrastructure, security operations for tooling, crisis management teams for incident handling, to all implement the necessary measures that we've described in those policies. So our people create the policies and the policies then guide our people. Technology. These are the measures, as we mentioned, that project that protect our crown jewels, PII, intellectual property, client data, operational data. They'll all be familiar to you. Firewalls, password policies, antivirus, cloud security, secure messaging, device management, secure infrastructure, logging and monitoring, and more. But once again, once humans have implemented these measures, it's humans that are tasked with maintaining them. So what does that mean? Well, our people have what are essentially two back doors into the organization. One, into the management of the security tooling itself, and two, into the valuable data behind it. For example, salespeople have access to our CRMs. Our HR team has direct access to our HR data. Our operations may have direct access to our manufacturing plans. So humans here, and we'll start to build a picture now as why they are the first line of defense and often the first targets for attack, is that humans are the central pillar. So in theory, we have three. In reality, the people pillar is the foundational support, and they are tasked with upholding the process and the technology. And attackers know this. 84% of attempted cyber attacks across 2022 and 23 targeted humans through social engineering attacks or business email compromise. Of successful attacks, three quarters of them were via humans. So not only are attackers targeting our people, but they are seeing resounding success. But these statistics are informative. Why are they targeting humans? Not only for where they sit within an organization, but humans are intrinsically flawed. Unlike a binary firewall rule, allow, deny, humans can make mistakes. We can make mistakes, we can be manipulated, we can have our human nature turned against us. So, how exactly are they doing it? This is where we come on to OSINT and social engineering. So open source intelligence is the collection and analysis of data gathered from open sources to produce actionable intelligence. This is a legal gray area as well. It's problematic for those in the cybersecurity industry. Imagine somebody sat outside your house in their car every day for a month. You're suspicious, you report it to the police and they say, well, until they actually try and break in, we can't do anything. It's the same with open source intelligence. Intentions make this difficult to deal with. The second, social engineering. Now, attackers turn people's nature against them through knowing their targets, their context, their job roles, their key psychological triggers, which we're gonna to get to. The better an attacker understands their target, the easier they can formulate a pretext that's likely to succeed. So social engineering is around manipulating people. And it takes many forms. It could be walking up to an office door with a hot coffee in each hand and ask the person stood outside on a smoke break to open up, appealing to their inner empathy response, one psychological trigger. It could be impersonating a CFO, manipulating a member of the finance team into paying a bogus invoice. Most commonly, it's phishing or it's its subsidiaries, vishing, voice phishing, smishing, SMS phishing. But the crucial thing to understand here with the relationship between them is that OSINT is an enabler for more effective social engineering attacks. We talk about knowing our target and it's OSINT that allows the attackers to get there. So I want you to consider these two phishing attempts. And here we're gonna introduce the concepts of phishing, which is passive quantity over quality catch-all versus spear phishing, proactive quality over quantity with personalized triggers. This is going to be an example of how OSINT can feed and enable 
social engineering attacks. So, example number one will look like something that's sat in most of your inboxes. Particularly lazy attack, all the signs are there as a fish. The sender domain is blatantly bogus, certainly not from American Express. The logo is very much out of proportion. All rights reserved being right next to the company signature is quite odd. And of course, the email isn't addressed personally. So when we talk about general phishing, it's passive. They may send out a million of these to email addresses that have been leaked in a huge database. But now we're gonna use the open source intelligence that we found on Jonathan, and we're gonna create something a little more personalized. Now bear in mind that this was constructed from a 10 minute scroll through Jonathan's socials. It's not perfect, but this is something that we've managed to construct very, very quickly. Directed attempts from a committed attacker will be backed by a magnitude more in terms of the investigation and resource behind it. So why is it good? Well, the email is addressed directly, including information that isn't necessarily immediately available, and certainly not what a lazy attacker would put in. We've got Jonathan's middle initial, we've got his date of birth, and the stadium location. So we're starting to build trust with Jonathan. He's thinking, well, nobody outside of Aston Villa will know exactly where I sit. So we're starting to build some trust into here that this has come from the legitimate source that holds his data. The old address is in there too. Again, perhaps another trigger to trust that source. Why would any attacker have this kind of information? The color scheme matching the AVFC club colors, some graphical work with a mock up season ticket, and something that those without a keen eye may not spot is that we have a bogus URL with a little bit of trickery with the dash. So it's the untrained eye, they may see this as the legitimate Aston Villa website. So from 10 minutes of open source intelligence research, we've gone from what you may consider a bog standard American Express fish to this. Highly personalized and highly appealing to the individual that we are targeting specifically. Oliver, with apologies yes. for potentially stealing your thunder um, subsequently, Mm -hmm. What might make a particular individual someone uh, that the bad guys want to invest time in attacking via spear phishing? Mm -hmm. Okay, so spear phishing is generally motivated by what, what we call HVTs, high value targets. Now, high value targets have a number of criteria. One, maybe that they are high profile. So somebody may have an interest in causing them PR issues. Two is that they have ownership of or access to particularly sensitive or valuable data. So for example, a C-level individual within an organization. Or three, the financial motivation, high net worth individuals, or people that work closely with other high net worth individuals. So high value targets tend to be those that provide provide attackers enough motivation to spend that extra time in constructing specific attacks. I feel Does quite privileged to, to, to have been selected then, Oliver, thank you. <laughs> High value you are, there we go. <laughs> so there's always a pattern with fishes. Now these apply both to your lazy fishing, the passive stuff, and the spear fishing. Three key psychological triggers, fear, trust and desire so the lazy ones will even often contain a number of these your account may be locked or they're going to pose as a trusted figure the nhs for example during covid or for desire answer this email log in if you want to make a million pounds a day right we've seen these albeit in the lazy forms but we see them attackers are clued up on these even if they are not willing to spend the time on a spearfish but with a spearfish, we can get really personal. So for Jonathan, we ticked these. Number one, fear, a potential issue perhaps with Jonathan's season ticket or Aston Villa login. The second one was the major one, trust. We appeared to come from a trusted entity by providing supporting information that only that entity should have. Jonathan's old address, his date of birth, his seat number. The third one, desire to go and see the villa, right? 
So we've got three key psychological triggers, but this time they're personalized to get specifically Jonathan to be more inclined to click. So why does it matter when it comes to crisis management? We start with this principle that nobody is unhackable unless you have, you've got to be the terminator here, zero fear response, you don't trust anybody at all, and you don't desire anything whatsoever in life. If you don't meet those three criteria, we can all be hit. So, with regards to the internal approach to a zero blame culture, this is something that's going to be key when we talk about social engineering attacks and in, in particular victims of social engineering attacks. I want you to consider two examples here. We've got two businesses. Both of them have suffered an attack that has originated, or patient zero if you will, is one of their employees. But they're going to handle it in very different ways. Business one is going to be quite heavy handed and business two has a zero blame culture. So how do they compare? Business one immediately suspends the employee. They've identified that the issue has come from this employee, whatever nature it may be, whether malicious or mistaken, and they've suspended them. Business two has just asked them to go home, take the day off, we'll get this sorted. Business one then excludes that employee from their internal communications, whereas business two includes that employee. We're dealing with this in attack as an organization, as a team, and that is how we're going to communicate. Now, I have asterisk that one. And the reason that is asterisk is, of course, if this has been identified as a malicious insider, there will be, of course, some different routes. But when we talk high level here about the zero blame culture, if, for example, an employee has mistakenly clicked a phishing email and caused an incident, we shall still be including them in those team communications. Business one has circulated the name of that employee, for example, perhaps in their internal communications or just through whispers through WhatsApp groups and friends and social circles within the organization. Whereas business two, the name is on a need to know basis. The IT and security team know, but outside of that, the name has been kept confidential. Business one, the investigation. So once they're moving on to that recovery and remediation period, they've been quite heavy handed. They've fired questions, they've asked them to return their devices, they have shown very little sensitivity, whereas business two, they've gone to the person last. They've done the investigations they can through IT, they've looked at perhaps the logs of their devices, so zero touch for that individual. And then if they still really need to, they can go back to the person and just say, hey, what happened here? Business one reinstated that individual with some one-to-one -one training. You're coming back in, but on Monday morning, you need to sit with our IT or security team and have some training. Whereas business two understood that this is still an organizational issue and they issued some booster or refresher team training to everybody. Finally, we move on to pastoral care. Now, if that individual's breach has caused issues for perhaps their colleagues where personal information has leaked, they might be quite traumatized. They might be feeling some serious responsibility for what's happened. Whereas business two makes sure that they're looked after physically, mentally, and emotionally. So these are two very different approaches from a business, the business two practicing a zero blame approach. Now, how's that going to impact what happens next? Well, let's say, for example, business one, after having the previous incident, as another incident, an employee has received a phishing email. They click, they submit their credentials, it happens. But fearing repercussions based on what happened last time, they've delayed reporting that incident. They're trying to create perhaps a narrative or something that's gonna protect them. When they're queried, they hold back key detail. What really happened was that they submitted their credentials. What they tell the security team is that they clicked on the email, realized what it was, and then deleted it. Other employees are also unhelpful, also fearing repercussions. They may not be helping that individual. They may not be helping the business in their investigation. If the crisis deepens, then a self-preservation sentiment will prevail within that workforce. They're looking after themselves because they've seen what can happen to individuals that can be held liable. Whereas business two has a far easier time. 
The employee receives the phishing emails before they submit their credentials, but they realize the mistake, they immediately notify the business through established mechanisms, and that information can help to get that investigation underway as soon as possible. IT and security operations can respond to the incident at source. So instead of having to dig through perhaps logs or the email filters, they can respond directly because they know exactly whose inbox this has landed in and who has clicked. What does this mean? Faster mean time to detect the incident and faster mean time to respond. These are key metrics for any incident response process. Finally, if the crisis does deepen, the workforce is more likely to be helpful as they are needed. Zero blame culture will foster a positive two-way benefit when dealing with crises arising from social engineering attacks. So the business benefits because they receive the reports that they need sooner and the information that they need in better detail. And the people benefit because we don't get that self-preservation. They're willing to help, even though they believe they could be at risk. They know that the business will not hold them liable. Now, I referred to it briefly before, but a really, really key consideration here is that social engineering attacks create additional victims. A tech-based cyber attack, for example, a vulnerability in some software, it's organizational in nature, but a social engineered attack can place a feeling of responsibility for that fallout on one person. They can really feel the pressure. And as we said, it could, it could include private information leaks belonging to their peers, their friends, or if their friends are practicing bad password hygiene, all of a sudden, not only are their business accounts compromised, but their personal accounts as well. That, that individual can feel a lot of pressure. So the human aspect here is really, really important. So to truly embrace a zero blame approach, businesses have to accept the responsibility for their human layer of cybersecurity. Responsibility to train their people, to improve their people, protect them both from a cybersecurity sense and an emotional sense, with them knowing that humans are intrinsically fallible. So we have to strike a balance with the external approach. So we've talked about the internal approach and communications. Now, what do we use externally, especially in the case of cyber uh, social engineering attacks? Now. Honesty is often the best policy, fact-based honesty, of course. Let's say, for example, there's been a fire at the office and things are gonna be unavailable while they spin up a new site for a day. Honesty works fine. We know what's happened, we know what the crisis is, we know to the extent to which it might spread, and we have a rough timeline on when we're getting back. We know who's impacted and how. Now consider this scenario. This company provides patient management and HR management software. They advertise their case studies and their partners on their website. They've suffered an attack, and one hour into the investigation, they've discovered that the attack originated through a vulnerability in their software. Their own HR data might have been exfiltrated. What do they report? How do they communicate an attack like this externally? Now, option one is that whole truth approach. We've pinpointed the issue to a vulnerability in our data management software, and we're diligently working to fix the issue. We've issued temporary advisories to our customers. So in theory, that's fine. Look, it's gonna provide people with the trust that everything's under control. Within an hour, we know where the vulnerability is, we know what's going on, and we're working to fix it. But that could pose a risk. Why don't we look at option two? Still the truth, but measured. We've identified the source of the incident and we're working diligently to contain the matter. We're in communication with our partners and customers. The reason here that option two might be better is that attackers will often have their ears to the ground looking for knock-on effects and risks of cyber attacks. So in this case, the organization that provides that software has had an internal has had an attack and they're breached internally because of that software vulnerability. Now, if they publish the details of it, attackers might go on the website, look at the partners that they're advertising and the customers and the use cases and testimonials, and then leverage that same exploit across their customer base and stakeholders. 
So sometimes with cyber attacks, it's really important to consider the potential knock-on effects of the attack. So we have to ask key considerations. Who else is at risk internally and externally? Again, we could still be putting our own employees at risk. Might this communication plan spur further attacks on our key stakeholders? How can we communicate just enough to inspire trust that the situation is under control while still protecting key stakeholders? So we've just gone past the half hour mark. Um, so Jonathan, I'm gonna hand back to you for questions, but hopefully you've just given everyone a really good overview of not only social engineering, but the knock-on effects that can happen both internally and externally, and of course, how they can impact our communication strategies, both internally and externally. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. Fascinating and uh, scary in equal measure. Um, one of the things that really resonated with me was the zero blame culture. It's something we talk a lot about with regards to crisis management in general. Clearly, uh, you can't manage a crisis until you know that it's happened and therefore the ability uh, and empowerment and psychological safety that enables uh, people in the front line, people at very junior levels to flag up that there's an issue, whether it's a phishing attack or some other form of crisis is so critical in facilitating your crisis response. So uh, I'd really encourage everyone on this call to do whatever you can and encourage leaders within your businesses to do whatever they can to create that kind of a culture. It feels a bit scary but actually it's going to pay dividends if you want to protect the organization in the worst case. So I have um, a few questions that I wanted to put to Oliver, but again, as always, uh, we're very interested in your questions too. So please post those via the uh, question function on your control panel. Um, I guess one of the things that people like to get out of these sessions, Oliver, is to understand you know, what's, what's changing and what's going to change in future. So I think my first question would be, what, what have you seen in terms of changes? Well, what's on the increase at the moment or over the last couple of years? And what do you maybe predict or see happening next over the forthcoming 12 months or so? Hmm. Certainly no new era over the last couple of years. I don't think we've had any major pivotal uh, evolutions in the world of social engineering. The, the most significant differences that we've seen are flavor of the day narratives. So COVID was an amazing example. Um, the bogus vaccine messaging that was coming through. Uh, I know texts were landing up and down the country for to click and book in the vaccine. So flavor of the day is changing. There's also trends in the approach that are rising and falling. So WhatsApp scams, for example, pretending to be a parent or child with a new number, or uh, even some more technical aspects. So for example, phishing emails using graphical assets to bypass text-based spam filtering. So they may use all of the text, save it as an image or a screenshot and paste that directly into an email so that certain uh, certain spam filters can't detect uh, phishing, commonly used phishing text. So there hasn't been any major changes. It's more about the approach. But I think that new frontier is coming. Uh, a couple of you might groan when I say the words here because it's up and down your LinkedIn feeds and your social media feeds. But AI, um, firstly, at the very basic level, one of the ways that we often spot lazy phishing attempts is bad grammar, bad language, bad spelling. Well, firstly, AI, AI will completely rid those issues in the first place. But looking at the next step, imagery, videos, deep fakes. And the one that's, I think, most concerning to me personally is voice. Uh, we may have seen videos that go viral recently. So there was one, I think it was Leonardo DiCaprio delivering a speech to one of the UN bodies. And throughout the video, his voice keeps changing. I think we had uh, the Terminator, we had Arnold Schwarzenegger's voice in there, uh, Barack Obama's voice, Joe Biden's voice. And for people where there are loads of samples to take, the ability of AI to take those samples and transform them into saying whatever we want to say is really problematic. Partly because we use voice very often as almost a human two-factor authentication mechanism, right? Say we get an email request that we believe is quite sensitive. 
And we call that person up, our colleague, just to say, hey, is this legit? Well, if there's an AI fakery on the other end of the line, that's going to be quite tough. Um, with regards to the answer, we will see. I think live video may become prominent. Um, we may also end up with intra-business 2FA tokens, for example. Uh, you know, you generate a code on request and it should match up with the request, with the code that your colleague sees. But the next frontier of social engineering is almost certainly going to be heralded and marked by the advancements in AI. Thank you. Um, question come in from Andrea. Um, given what you've said about 84% of um, hacking attempts coming via the human factor, hmm. why do you think it is that businesses tend to focus more attention on the technological solutions rather than investing in protecting the uh, human factor? Hmm. Great question. Really good question. Uh, partly trends, the cybersecurity industry has focused for a number of years, as I said, 20 to 30 years on the technical solutions. So they've been what's e most easily available. But I think we've existed almost with, uh, with an attitude that the tech side is the easiest to fix and it's the easiest one to build defense in depth with. And that if we can create a zero trust environment as opposed to zero blame, then we may be more secure. But what we've realized as the tide has turned from the attacker's perspective, so just for, for more context here, that 84% number three years ago was in the low 30%. So it's partly that the industry is actually starting to react rather than being proactive to attackers. So traditionally, a lot of our vulnerabilities have come from uh, tech-based issues. But now, you know, with standardized security measures with uh, third-party cloud providers as opposed to on-site infrastructure, um, attackers are finding it harder and harder because of the uh, measures that are in place, the frameworks that are becoming almost ubiquitous, as I said, with, with ISO, with NIST, um, and just given the amount of investment that has gone in to the technical side and, of course, the policy and procedure side. So attackers are now taking the path of least resistance. Yeah. And as I said, when you look at the actual success rate of those attempts on people, they they're enjoying success and those numbers are only going to go up from here so it's a case of industry trends path of least resistance and ultimately as I said a backdoor into the security tooling and the data that they want interesting so again like other criminals they're going for the yeah path of least resistance they're, they're going for the easiest way the uh the security measures, the technological security measures have been put in place and mm. again, it's like house alarms. Um, so we have to find an alternative route in. Um, Absolutely. Kind of... just to, sorry, just to add yeah. that, Jonathan, it's a great metaphor. It's a great example. If, uh, if you picture a house where they've got no expenses spared on security technology, but somebody leaves the front door open when they come in. <laughs> yeah. You know, and if you can yeah. have somebody open that door for you, it can render that technology irrelevant for the breach. Now, of course, it can help. And I'm not saying defense in depth isn't important. Post breach, having that technology in place is crucial and it can be a fail safe for humans, but they are still the first line of defense. Yeah, I guess my next question is a follow on from that, given that a determined attacker can breach almost any defenses and given that building you know human resilience is possibly harder to achieve than technological resilience is it really worth the effort trying to do that absolutely but it's all about the approach the the, the approach is really important here because you I, I, I'm of the school of thought that you have to get people thinking like an attacker. I think if you can have people thinking like an attacker, they are going to be far harder. The, the thing is, you know, we mentioned with high value targets before, but ultimately time equals money for most of these attackers. And if yeah. you're a difficult target, 
it's not a case of getting away from the attack entirely. It's being the one that they just get turned off from completely. Yeah. So uh, one of my favorite phrases in this sense is, you don't need to be faster than the bear. You need to be faster than the person next to you. Yeah. And that's, that's the key message here. Um, if you are sufficiently protected, you are vigilant, you're aware, then there will come a point where they either don't bother constructing an attack in the first place or they move on because time yeah. equals money and they're not quite getting what they need. So people will always try, absolutely, but it's making ourselves just out of reach, just that too, little bit too hard that they're just not either going to bother or that we are resilient enough that we have damage limitation in place should something happen. For example, if your credentials are fished for one of your accounts, but as part of your personal cybersecurity sphere, you have good password management and good hygiene, it's going to be limited to that account. You're not facing a situation where that password is reused across three, four, five, six different services. So it's a mixture. It's making yourself a very difficult target, but because of the good practices you have in place anyway, you're going to limit that damage afterwards. Yeah. So again, it's it's like home security. It's not about making your home impregnable. It's about making it a harder target than another one further down the road because the criminals would rather go for an easier opportunity than a really, really tough one. Correct. Absolutely. And if they do get through the front door, they're then faced with the further three locked doors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what should we be looking at as individuals or what should we be encouraging our people within our business to be looking at in terms of where are the most typical or common places that the cyber criminals will go to in terms of open source intelligence? Oh, social media. Yeah, social okay. media, absolutely. Um, again, when we talk about the industry trends, I mean, part of the reason with social engineering coming to the fore is that we are exposing more information about ourselves than we ever have done before. Um, social media is absolutely the number one culprit. But I should say, and it is really important, that even if we ourselves aren't overly active, or at least we are very careful about what we do post on social media, very often it's our loved ones that actually cause the data exposure. So it's important that everyone in your circle has the same approach and same attitude to an extent. Um, when I'm running open source intelligence investigations, stop number one is the individual themselves. Stop number mm -hmm. two is the people around them. Because chances are out of you know, a circle of associates of three, four, five people, at least one of them is going to be lax on their social media. And very often you can get enough about your target from them um even though that individual does does really well but yeah number one culprit is uh, is absolutely social media um in in this age and always the first place to look yeah and it's interesting i'm thinking about uh, one of our clients who clearly i won't name but who um has relationships with high net worth individuals and provides services to high net worth individuals if you know, completely innocently, a member of their team tweets about where in the world or where in the country they happen to be, or doesn't even tweet where they are, but it's clear that they are with their, their client and that post can be geolocated. That mm. is a significant risk. So I think there are sometimes hidden threats or hidden vulnerabilities that people don't realize they're exposing mm. yourself to yeah there, there's if um if you heard of bellingcat so they are and have been for a while now at the forefront of open source investigative reporting so for those that aren't familiar with them um <clears throat> bellingcat uncovered the uh, mystery behind the downing of mh17 over ukraine uh, a number of years ago and also uncovered the two gentlemen behind the scripal poisoning in salisbury all through open source intelligence. Now we talk about how people around you can expose you. The squadron that was involved with the MH17 or battalion legion, I'm not sure exactly how the Russians, uh, how their terminology works to their army, but the team that was behind the surface to air missile launch, they found on the Russian version of Facebook called V Contact, a picture of a wedding 
at which they were all sat around the table. So they went from having the name of one individual to suddenly having a dossier on almost every single one of them. So it's often, again, people yeah. around us that are the ones yeah. that can expose us. Fascinating. Um, final question from me would be, okay, so what are some of the first things or critical things that businesses should be doing to make sure that they are plugging this vulnerability? The first one is, is to accept the responsibility uh, with mm -hmm. regards to the people to, to understand that just as it is in a business's interest to implement security tooling, they shouldn't view their people any differently, that, that with the people they have to work with them, they have to establish a positive, proactive culture towards the human layer of cybersecurity. Um, and there are models and guidances out there as well. So the SANS Institute have some excellent resources for planning organizational human layer security. Um, and once they've accepted you know, that, that this is part of our overall cybersecurity posture, it's about making sure that we make things relatable. The mm -hmm. prevailing approach at the moment in the industry tends to be e-learning modules, for example. They get an email and they need to do their six monthly or annual cybersecurity training. And everyone in the business from the CEO uh, to the sales team, finance team, whoever they are, they're going to be faced with the same training, which is effectively a list of do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. But it's not high impact. It isn't relatable. The other thing is, is just make sure that everybody understands the risks and issues that may pass their specific desks. Yeah. Making these things something that they can understand. And that's, again, the importance of bringing in that attacker's perspective. If people can understand how an attacker is thinking, they are more likely to be more dynamic in their defense. So just to sum up that, <clears throat> accepting the responsibility of the organization to its people to help them, making sure that they're getting engaging uh, and tailored uh, training and engagements that, that, that are relevant and helpful to them, um, and then referring to the resources and models that are out there on how to build this up from zero to being extremely resilient on the human layer excellent thank you oliver so i'm now going to uh, just some share share some news with uh, participants in this webinar before summarizing and thanking uh, oliver in a couple of minutes time but before doing that as i say i wanted to let everyone on this call know that uh, it's been fantastic doing webinars over the last couple of years and indeed during the pandemic but i'm really pleased to let you know that we are going to get back together face to face and that we will be hosting a crisis management conference in london at the churchill war rooms on the 7th of september so just under a couple of months time it'll be a full day free event with speakers covering a whole range of topics from cyber security through to reputational risk, the impact of regulation, um, ISO 22361, case studies, and uh, an interactive exercise. Places are genuinely limited. The room isn't quite as small as the one that you see on the screen at the moment, but it is limited in terms of the number of people that can attend. So I wanted to give you a heads up that invitations will be going out on uh, Monday. Clearly, we we will prioritise uh, clients, and we're going to have to uh, prioritise and limit attendees to in-house crisis management uh, professionals. But if you're particularly keen to get a seat at that conference, when the follow-up to this webinar comes out later on this afternoon, please just uh, drop us a line back to. Uh, let us know that you'd like to be on the priority list for this event. I do feel this is a little bit like uh, a Taylor Swift concert, trying to get tickets for that, albeit maybe hopefully tens of people wanting tickets rather than millions of people. But yeah, do let us know if you're particularly keen to attend and we'll get you your invitation out slightly ahead of the uh, broader mailing. Um, so a date for your diaries and something we'd love to see 
as many people as possible attend particularly with that opportunity to network with your peers and um, to have a chat with the insignia team too so to summarize first of all oliver thank you so much i think your specialist and deep knowledge of this area is fascinating it's made me rethink what i post about the beloved aston villa um <laughs> And uh, yeah, thank goodness uh, you're not a Birmingham City supporter, otherwise the attack could well have been for real. But I do appreciate your time and your expertise. Uh, Oliver's details are, are there if you'd like to reach out to him. If you have any questions, I'm sure Oliver would be very happy to respond or indeed if you uh, need some support in uh, making your own people more resilient and less vulnerable to um, cyber attacks. Likewise, uh, if you have any questions for me, uh, if there's anything you'd like my help with, please drop me a line, give me a call. Um, so thank you all for sparing the time today for joining us for our latest webinar. This will be the uh, last webinar pre the summer holiday period and as I say we will be back with a physical face-to-face -face event which i'm really looking forward to so thank you for joining us hope you enjoyed and uh, got benefit from this discussion look forward to seeing you in september in the meantime have a crisis-free afternoon and also a crisis-free summer thanks everyone bye-bye <laughs>